Genshin Impact's world building sucks and I am going to fix it. <laughs> just kidding. I actually think it's pretty good, but there's some of its finer details that are just absolutely incomprehensible unless you read every single item description and decrypt all the random robot numbers on the top of mountains so cold that they're literally killing you. And then there's also some real life issues that Genshin Impact chooses to address in ways that I would address differently. But I want to acknowledge that Genshin Impact is also made by a Chinese developer, so naturally their cultural perspective and priorities are going to be different from mine, a person from the United States. With Natlin just around the corner, I decided to show you how I would redesign all of Genshin Impact in my style, which is to say my world building style, my game design style, and some of my questionable art style. Though remember, I'm a game designer, uh, not a game artist for a reason. Uh, but even as I convert everything to my style, I still want to keep the core tone and thematic elements the same. By the way, I'm Amai Guri, I'm a professional game dev, but also I am a big Genshin Impact and Hoyoverse fan. I've been playing Genshin Impact since launch, I just started ZZZ, their other game, um, I'm the only person who liked Inazuma, and now I'm learning Chinese specifically to play these games in their original language. So, like, obviously, I have a great respect and admiration for the characters and writing, world building, and game design of Hoyoverse games. So despite my clickbait opening here, I don't actually hate Genshin Impact, but this is my take on it. And where I can, I'll see if I can give you some of my game designer expertise as I do this. Let's begin by discussing the objectives for this project. As you probably heard me say in the past, creative work is subjective. So the only way you know if you something is working for you is if you put your own parameters on it, your own design pillars or design objectives. We'll begin by identifying what is at the core of the Genshin Impact experience. I'd say that's the open world action RPG with gacha elements. It's a cozy fantasy with a dark anime story. It's the core concept of the story is that gods rule nations built around a specific value. Uh, each nation god value is associated with an element in their elemental magic system, and each character has a weapon, an element, and a myriad of abilities based off of those. Along with unique voice lines that you can read in a menu, Genshin Impact, why don't these just play around the world? You have the lines pre-recorded, just randomly play them instead of having Nuvalet describe water to me for the umpteenth time while I stand still. You have dozens of recorded lines. Oh, it's fine, don't worry. So that's what we're going to redesign. But what does my style look like when it comes to developing games and stories? I'd say when I make games, I make small, exploration-focused detective games built around knowing things to proceed. This is for two reasons, actually. First is scope. I usually don't have the resources to build like open-world RPGs with all these gameplay elements, so um, have instead focusing on knowledge is a really great way to scope down on the programming cost. The second is because I actually really struggle to read things in most games unless it's a detective game because suddenly knowing things isn't just cool, it's core to the mechanics of the game. I really like when my mechanics align with my narrative. That's called ludonarrative synchronicity. I also really feel like I'm known for my non-Tolkien-esque political fantasies aimed at uh, young adults. And I also like little girls with big, sometimes metaphorical, guns and Machiavellian sociopaths. Oh, and I like when all of my characters grapple with their past trauma. Hey look, something Genshin and I already have in common. Oh, and if you want to play my games, actually, my personal project, Little Vern Maiden, is an assassin life sim about murder and self-care. It's a short, janky little game, but it's like mm, uh, three bucks USD. So I think it's still pretty cute. Uh, head over to itch.io if you want to pick that up. So it sounds like what we're designing today is an open world action game with information based puzzles. It, it is a cozy fantasy with a focus on international politics between gods. Elements will be a key theming device, and I'll need to make a couple of gotcha characters to fit this new world. So let's actually start with the elements because I think that's gonna guide the rest of my design. So Genshin Impact has seven elements, each associated with a god, a value, and a real world culture from which they take inspiration. Animo is wind, air, freedom, and is based on Germany slash France. Geo is rock or earth, which its value is contracts and it's based on China. Electro is lightning slash electricity. Its value is eternity, and it's based on Japan. Dendro is about plants slash wood. Its value is knowledge, 
and it is based off of India, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East, and Egypt? Yeah, that's kind of a big reach in Genshin. Isn't that kind of big? That's kind of a lot. Uh, anyway, uh, Hydro is water, justice, and France again, but this time also kind of England and Switzerland. Uh, Pyro is fire, war, and South America and West Africa. Oh boy, Hoyo, you sure you want to do all that? That You're biting off... The other places were based off a country, and you're doing, like, two continents? Okay, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and lastly, Cryo is ice, love, duality, ambition. It's actually kind of unclear at the moment, um, but it is a Slavic-inspired region. I actually really like the representing and respecting real-life cultures when they do it right mm, in Genshin. I feel, I mean, like, you can see some of the pale skin preferences of their Japanese and Chinese audiences really blanching out the cast, but they also do things like recreate accurate Persian court dances, or make documentaries on intangible cultural artifacts and food that's and mm, from, like, uh, you know, uh, throughout China, and I think that that's really going above and beyond, in my opinion. I think that's one of the truly magical elements of their studio. But all that being outlined, seven elements is a lot. I'd much rather do five. This way, L every element has two allies and two enemies. And oh, is that just the magic, the gathering color, the wheel again? God darn. So we could do the classic Greek four, water, fire, earth, air, and add the classic fifth element, ether, or soul, or whatever. Uh, we could also rip the five element system from China, which is water, fire, wood, earth, metal. Um, but... Electro is my favorite element in Genshin, so I feel like I gotta have electricity, you know? Maybe I could do the five breath we weapons of D&D Tiamat, which is fire, electric, ice, acid, and chlorine? <laughs> I would made about this for a bit, but I decided to settle on water, fire, earth, which will include plants, life, which will include electricity because of nerves and animals, and death, which is, in fact, just... Magic of the Gathering is color pie again. God dang. We'll make sure to change the values at least, okay? We'll rotate them around a little bit. Honestly, I think my time on Magic of the Gathering kind of fundamentally changed how I categorize all cultures ever. Value-wise, let's steal freedom, contracts, and knowledge as values from Genshin, because freedom versus contracts is a really good value dichotomy that I really like, and knowledge is just a fun motivation. But ignorance doesn't really work as a counterpoint to it, because there's not really anywhere in the world that values ignorance. Um, maybe action, man of action versus man of knowledge. Um, you could call that ambition. Uh, and then I kind of feel like the last one has to be emotions somehow, like love or passion. Um, I mean, because then we could have a trio of like, why are you doing something? Because you can, because you want to, or because you must. And then knowledge, ambition, or maybe we could call it progress. Or evolution, which is just green and magic gathering. I mean, but evolution is good. Mm -hmm. Nol and in this, and for us, knowledge and evolution can sit opposite of each other, and so that leads to picking our cultural inspirations. Uh, so I'm going to draw out this wheel here and assign values and cultures. I'm going to try to make them make sense, but I don't want them to be totally obvious. Like, I think fire and passion is really cliche and has been done too much. Um, so what I'm going to do is do it like this. Fire is going to be knowledge, and its culture is going to be the Caliphates in Arabia. This is because the Arabic Peninsula is hot, and the Caliphates did a ton of work to preserve Greek knowledge during the quote-unquote Dark Ages, but it's really only dark in Europe. Um, and they discovered a ton of stuff that we in the Western world now weirdly attribute to white people who rediscovered them later. Water is going to be based off of contracts. And that's going to, its culture is going to be Sui Dynasty China. I think contracts is a really good way to represent the structured society of China and the way Confucianism works, as well as the fact that their dragons are associated with water. And also, they made a bunch of cool waterworks in the Sui Dynasty that really revolutionized their trade and stuff. So I'm keeping China in, in the bag. China's huge anyway, so it's fine. For Earth, I'm going to have that be associated with evolution and their culture is going to be the Byzantine Empire, because Earth changes into different forms slowly over time, kind of like the Roman Empire. And what did the Roman Empire evolve into? The Byzantine Empire, that's right. Next, life is going to be associated with passion, and it's going to be based off of 1818 Switzerland, because that's when and where Frankenstein is set. See what I'm doing there? See what I'm doing there? Electricity, life, passion. <laughs> and lastly, we've got death, which I'm going to associate with freedom and Viking-era Norway. 
this is because Norwegian people or Scandinavian people from that era, uh, they sailed a lot, which is like having freedom. Uh, they raid places, which is death. And uh, honestly, I think you could do something with like how modern death metal takes influence from Nordic cultures. So that's that's what I'm going with there. I try to be really specific with my cultural inspirations whenever I do world building, because I think interesting world building really comes from specificity. Is nothing is ever, nor should be, truly original, in quotes. Like, actually original thoughts are the ones that come from the nuance and depth of a specific situation. For the geopolitical side of my world building, we're just putting them in this little ring, so each has two allies and two enemies. Well, enemies is maybe too strong for a cozy fantasy, so two rivals, we'll call it that. Now, obviously, if I were going to make this a full game, I would want to do a bunch of research. I say this every time I talk about research, researching for these YouTube videos on the world building to make it accurate. And if I was a big budget studio like Hoyo, I'd send my artists and writers overseas to not just see local cultures, but to talk to cultural consultants there and experience these other cultures firsthand. One of these days, I'm going to have to do a video on actually how to research to complement my historiography video. Leave a comment if you'd like that. In the meantime, please enjoy these sketches that were researched enough-ish to get me through an AP high school class here in the US. Game design! If you haven't played Genshin Impact, the basic premise is you start as one character whose abilities set up the next character. Like here, I'm playing Yoimiya who shoots fireworks, and then after her finale here, I switch to Raiden Shogun to do more damage because of the firework buff plus the knockback damage in that overload reaction there. And then you switch between your characters a lot because most elements interact with each other. And some even react specifically with two or more elements, like the order matters and stuff. For what I'm working on today, I think I'm just going to keep the reactions in this chart, but it would be really cool for three element reactions where sequence matters as a start of the second act twist to the gameplay. Order doesn't matter for this one though, so I left the duplicates blank. As you can see, we've got Vaporize, this one I'm stealing from Genshin. It does explosive damage, but it also lowers visibility with the steam. Um, then we're going to have Forge and Quench. These are cool opposites that I thought would reflect how Earth is about evolution. Forge would make the player stronger temporarily, like a shield, and uh, Quench would make their attacks do more damage. Invigorate and Pyre. I was thinking about how fire is the, the or about like the fire of life, or living fire is a thing, and also about how pyres are associated with the end of life. So Invigorate would actually be the way we heal over time, while Pyre would be about burning damage over time. Bloom. This one I am also stealing. I imagine this one makes blooms explode, dealing more damage. Possibly we could use it to summon animals or interact with summons somehow. And perhaps as a bonus thing, the blooms could stay in the world and you could use them for platforming. Sprout and Bury, I see these two as a pair. Sprout would launch enemies into the air, while Bury would put them into the ground, sticking them in place. Fairy. This one is inspired by how water is ferrying away souls or something. Um, and I like this, this idea it would create something in the world that would have a lot of horizontal movement for enemies, perhaps grouping them up for easier hits. And lastly, Ghostify. I'm thinking this one would be like a confuser stun. Maybe for big enemies, you would knock their ghosts out of their bodies, but smaller enemies would turn and attack their friends. Something I would definitely want to ensure if I were implementing these mechanics is that they would affect the bosses. It's just that the bosses would use these mechanics against you as well. Something less like the JRPG bosses from Genshin where the status effects don't matter, and something more like the bosses from Darkest Dungeon where they can be poisoned and, you can po and they can poison you. That's much more my style. Now in Genshin, there's a lot more going into the flow of the system design than what I'm imagining. Like they've got resin gates that uh, to the upgrade materials in different areas, and then resin is gated by time, but time can be reduced with Primo gems, and Primo gems can be earned by IRL money or exploration in the game. And then different combos of upgrade materials are applicable to different characters. It's nothing like the very clean systems I usually work with, mostly because I'm small brained and I just need spreadsheets to help me with even simple systems. If I were designing Genshin Impact for myself, I would take the Mario plus Rabbids approach. Everything would be half or double, or a non-numerical value that was situationally useful, like knockback, or dashing, or swapping places with an enemy, or setting something on fire, or freezing something in place. 
The only thing I'd maybe make not half double is the leveling up system, but even then I would keep those numbers generally smaller. Like where one wasn't very much, but 10 was a lot. Numbers that we can do math with in our heads. And no, I'm not talking about all of you smart, handsome physics majors and engineers who can do big number math in your heads. I'm sure it's very nice to be smart, but I'm not. <laughs> now, uh, I think that crunching down the number spread to be smaller would lower build variety, so that's a disadvantage. But it would give greater distinction between the characters that were there, which I think is important. I want to acknowledge also there's a lot of merit to the big number go burr style of combat systems. It makes players feel powerful. But imagine if you start a game by hitting an enemy for one damage, and then at the end of the game you hit them for 128. That feels good. Meanwhile, if you start by hitting for 1000 damage and end the game by hitting the enemy for uh, 1028 damage, like, that doesn't feel as good. Or, sorry, 1128 damage. Mm, so, I just personally prefer smaller numbers, so because the scale feels better. This is just a style feature of mine. Outside the combat system, I'd make the puzzles based off of lore. And I'm aware that some of these puzzles exist in Genshin Impact, but it's not all of it. I would want to make sure that the lore that all of the lore would in fact relate to some puzzle or another. Or, if we're concerned about accessibility for people with uh, concentration issues or memory issues, we could have a fairy guide of some sort that you could turn on, perhaps one who is secretly the god of time who pauses the game for you, and then they can remind you of all the lore that you've read. I'd also want to keep the climbing and the parkour because I love Breath of the Wild stamina system so much and I honestly want it in every game, like with exploration. Something I love about Genshin, how Genshin uses it is that so far every region has gotten subtly harder to climb without feeling excessively gamey. Like in Mondstadt, the first area, look at these rooftops, they're relatively easy to climb, right? Out here in the second region in Liyue, they're much harder, but that doesn't feel like um, like an unnatural progression that just feels like the culture. And then in Inazuma, now they've got the radiation zones from the nuclear bombs, the lightning stuff, and that just feels like part of the world building. Or in Dragon's Fire, everything is cold, so your health ticks down because of how cold it is. Like, it just, it makes sense with the world building, it doesn't feel contrived. But while it's all fine and dandy to say what I would do, what matters is the actual execution. Unfortunately, as I started getting into this project more, I realized it wouldn't really be possible with a new reasonable timeline for me to make an entire uh, tiny version of Genshin Impact. So you're going to have to use your imagination for this next part. But let's talk about game design, production, and playtesting. Now, if I were actually making this, I wouldn't start out by modeling all these characters and stuff. I would start in a more or less empty room in Unity, which is the game engine that Genshin Impact is made in, and then use, mm, uh, and then make a third person controller to glide a capsule around. And then I'd maybe start getting in the climbing, maybe I'd use some sort of placeholder humanoid art, and I would start making that feel really good while I was thinking about the characters. I'd also want to start having it so that you could beat up a box and get that to feel good too. Maybe make some placeholder VFX to explode off of it. Oh, I'd also figure out my data structures for dialogues and books, which would presumably start with me watching YouTube videos on how other people do it, copying their code line for line, and then modifying it to my specific use case. For the combat, I would build everything on paper first, like a tabletop RPG version of the combat, just to see if my numbers worked. And then, when you can get the numbers to be fun without all the flashy animations, then you'll know they will definitely be fun once all the animations show up. That's how you guarantee that your game system's good. While I was working on all of this game design and implementation work, I would also start learning about implementing the art in the game. So I would build, take one character from design to implementation and one level from design to implementation with set dressing and all that in the art to determine how to min-max my time while still getting an acceptably beautiful game. And then once I figured out how much work all of these features were going to be, how much time and energy would take it, take me, I would overestimate how much time each feature would take, break it down into the hypothetical progress I would need to make each month to make meaningful milestones, and then, however long I thought that would take, I would multiply it by 1.5 times for unforeseen for circumstances and coding fires. Or literal fires, like when our server room caught fire in my junior year of college. <laughs> I would also schedule entire weeks dedicated to debugging and playtesting at least every month. Even with just the player in a single box level, I would sit someone down in front of the computer, hand them the controller, and watch what they pressed when the game came up. 
I would observe their reactions. I would take notes. Maybe I'd even record the playtest. Because there's nothing that teaches you faster about how to fix your game than watching someone else play it and usually break your game. So playtesting is really critical. It is critical to the point that when I watch these celebrity game journalists or game discussion people on YouTube make games like Mark Brown from GMTK or the people at Noclip Studios or even Ben Yahtzee Kroshaw from formerly Zero Punctuation and now fully Ramblematic, whenever they comment on playtesting, I just feel it in my soul because it's so relatable and yet I know that the average person does not understand how games are made. Like, it's just, mm, people don't get how important playtesting is, people don't understand the game making process, mm, because it's just so much more complex and varied than something like filmmaking, where you can hypothetically understand the very basic process of filmmaking because you can feasibly make a film on your phone, right? So, like, you know, it's just, playtesting is so important, I can't overemphasize it. So yeah, that's the hypothetical process. However, because I'm not insane, like I said, I'm not going to do a multi-year project in one month for a YouTube video, so you're just going to have to take my word for this hypothetical game production process. After all, mental health is very important, and sometimes it's more important that we get something done, like this cool YouTube video. Always try to finish something, even if it isn't the thing you initially set out to make. But that's the very basics of how I'd break it down, so just let me know if you ever want me to dive deeper into how game production works. So I think it's high time we actually develop the characters so we can see some of the specifics of my design principles and action. Some of my favorite characters in Genshin Impact are the Archons, aka the gods, and their closest companions whom they may or may not be dating, like Farina and Nuvalet, Nuvalet and Risley, Nahida and her inner circle, A and Yaimiko and Ayato, like they're all beautiful and perfect. Um, oh, I also really like Klee and Seguin. Um, they're very, very good. <laughs> uh, by the way, tell me your mains in Genshin, or, and are you guys playing ZZZ or Honkai Star Rail? Let me know. Yeah, with the basic world building designs that we've been sketching in the background, let's design a god and their companion, and before that, one extra critically important character, the world itself. In eons long past, the god of time wove the world out of five strands of fate. These each became the five elements. From this world were born many monsters, but the most terrible of them all were mankind. Over time, mankind seized the divine authority of the god of time, but even then they could not be satisfied. They fought vicious and bitter wars amongst themselves for divinity, until, 50 years ago, the current bearers of divinity forged a tentative peace. But even after 50 years of peace, there are those who remember the great divine war, and those who will try to start it up again. Now you might be saying, hey Val, how is this world history cozy? Listen, you can make anything cozy, especially the quiet after a great tumultuous period. So yeah, that's very loosely mimicking the world history of Genshin, but it's also specific enough to give us our own unique twist. Also, the fairy form of the god of time will be helping out the protagonist to try to bring true peace to the world while broken apart. And then maybe like the evil half of the god of time can be the final boss who's trying to steal all the elemental god's divinity back. And it'll be a story about how humanity becomes capable of building its own gods. And that can be like the main world quest in between all your cozy activities like researching flowers in the mountains or eating yummy food. For my god that I've decided to make, I decided to make the god of life and passion. So obviously we're just gonna na name him Victor, like Victor Frankenstein. Except this is an anime game. So obviously Victor is also actually a cute anime girl named Victoria Frankenstein, the flesh-stitched daughter of Victor Frankenstein and the one to complete his legacy and tame the monster. The monster would definitely be a world boss. Victoria would have the life element, obviously, due her, to her seizing the fates Mm, thread of life. She'd probably be a magic user, giving her science-y nature, um, but we should make her signature weapon something like a big magic-looking gun, because that's fun. Alternate cool weapons could be like a lightning rod magic staff, or a kite with a key on it inspired by Benjamin Franklin, or maybe like a giant scalpel the size of a polearm. I'd want Victoria to play as a sub-healer and life applicator, meaning her focus is setting up the finishing blows for somebody else. Her Elemental skill Adam would be summoning a small science experience experiment named Adam that would sit on the battlefield for a number of seconds equal to her elemental affinity. Every second, a line of lightning running between Victoria to Adam would apply life damage to all enemies in between. Her elemental burst would be Promethean Bolt. It's a really big bolt of lightning that would rain down over the battlefield, dealing an amount of life damage 
to a single target equal to double her elemental affinity, and doubling the effect of any reaction thereafter. Here's what I determined her numerical build would be at level 1, and then again at max level without any items. And here's two mini item sets and weapons that I designed for her that each push her towards a slightly different build. And now for her voice lines, because I am a game writer, so I have to do my best. But I'm not a voice actor, so you're gonna have to deal with my bad acting. Alright, here we go. It seems the threads of fate saw fit that our paths should cross. Rejoice, for I am the one and only heir to the luminary modern Prometheus, Victoria Frankenstein. And, as you'll soon see, Frankenstein's truer monster. Should you require anything, do not hesitate to ask. I'll simply say no if I don't feel like it. Dr. Frankenstein was my father, the creator of the monster. Truly a genius of his time, and yet he died because he feared what he had created. The monster should have been precious to him as I, a first child, a promised one. What a family we could have been. My hobby? Oh, I can't pick one. I paint, I dance, I crochet and cook. I love hunting and boating and reading and writing. I don't think there's anything I don't love. Why pick one hobby when you can do whatever suits your fancy? Life's too short to just have one kind of pleasure. Since I ascended, I never remember to sleep anymore. It's not that I slept much in a university anyway, but Lacerre won't rest until she knows I'm safe. It's very cute, but honestly, she takes her duties too seriously. I am a god. Adam, come forth. It's alive. <laughs> Defy your nature. Behold the will of the new gods. This is mankind's ascension. Ooh, anything good in there? Oh, you can keep it. I have 20 of those in my collection. Hmm, what did we get this time? Ugh, probably should heal. Just like university. Ah, my stitches! God of life. <laughs> Bring me back. Take the thread. Ow! Watch yourself. Ah, you have so many friends here! Yes, hello, it's me. I'm sure no further introduction is needed. Behold, your second Prometheus arrives. So as you can tell from her voice, I was kind of imagining her as like a Farina here, but I want her to be, have this sort of, um, uh, I, I have this idea that she's this really enthusiastic person who's really happy about life, but she still has the weight and remembrance of how her father failed the monster and how that created all these problems. If you don't know the story of Frankenstein, it's that Frankenstein made a human being out of dead body parts and then brought it to life with lightning and then uh, abandoned it because he, he was a terrible father. And then the story is kind of about like, is, it, is um, nature or nurture more important in a creature's uh, raising? I mean, it honestly kind of does both. I'm sorry, I, because like Victor himself had a great raising and yet he made a monster and was really irresponsible. The monster has a terrible raising, but he's not that monstrous. He like strangles like one or two or three guys. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's not that bad. And you might be like, well, Victor Frankenstein, he didn't kill anybody. Uh, yeah, but he abandoned a newborn. Is that, like, because he's a dum-dum? Like, is that... And he had, like, s nine months to think about it as he was building it, okay? So, like, who... And he ignored his entire family to do it. Like, come on, bro. Like, let's let's be so for real right now, right? Yeah, so, um, visually here, you can see I based it a little bit off traditional Swiss Alps-looking wear, but I made it a little bit more Genshinified. Not as much as some Genshin characters, because I definitely... Uh, I definitely do think there's some Genshin characters that are really pushing the boundary between being horny and being, uh, like, reasonable, attractive character designs, and I want to bring it back one step towards reasonable, practical character design. I think there's a time and place, um, but I don't think it, my, it's my style to make stuff that's super overtly horny. Uh, and as you can see, I did a couple of different uh, sketches for poses for her. I want her to have this sort of I'm reaching for the heavens vibe so that she looks, you know, like 
a god, but also she can be like the catalyst for lightning to strike down and bring life to Earth or whatever. So uh, yeah, that's kind of what I was going for here. Um, and also, uh, if I'm doing Candy and Rose like dynamics for my uh, god and her closest companion, then she would be something closer to the candy and our Rose would be our next character. Watch out, it might be someone that you recognize. Hmm. This is Lassar, an adopted Water Nation, I give them real names obviously, person. Uh, she would have been contracted to Victoria as a child, and they would have grown up together. And while at first it was her duty, she eventually would come to love Victoria too. Lassar would be a water element user, and then, though to be clear, well, the nation you're born with doesn't determine what thread of fate you're tied to, it's just that Lassar is water because the thing that motivates her is duty, which is a contract. Her signature weapon would be a pair of Sui Dynasty looking dual swords, quite possibly called Love and Kindness, though she wouldn't have named them that, but I like weapons that are named like puns. Lassar would play as kind of like a glass cannon. She's designed to deal a lot of water damage, but she'll keel over if you don't dodge. Her elemental skill, Crab Cut, would cause her to dash forward sharply and have invincibility fl frames, applying water as she slashed. Her water damage would be equal to her speed, but the dash distance would be set and unchangeable, and could even be used to traverse the world. Her elemental burst, Dragonstorm, would apply water to herself and any of her basic attacks for amount of time equal to her speed. Here's what I determined her numerical build would be at level 1 and at max level without any items. And here's two different weapon and mini item sets I made for her that each push her towards a different build. And her voice lines. You are not dressed properly for the weather here. Take my cloak, then we'll move out. Yes, I'm Lasser, here by request of Lady Victoria. Lady Victoria. There's no one more suited to godhood than her, I am certain. She is ruthless, decisive, and beautiful. I was born to serve her, but I would not have it any other way. Sometimes Lady Victoria and I go out to abandoned castle like these to search for treasure. I love the Time God's metal workings. I even have a whole collection. <clears throat> Stay close. There are still traps from the Divine War. Lady Victoria is the youngest of the gods, and I'm scared. Any mistake on my part may cause them to look down on her. I, I represent both her and my emperor. I have to put on a strong front. Be still. Silence. Ha! I am the storm. Humph. Humph. Drown in it. You're carrying that. Take that for later. Consider your pack weight. I don't need rest. It's nothing. This is fine. Ugh. Just a moment. Victoria. Focus. Enough! I'm here. Yes? I'm yours. When I was working on Lasser, obviously I wanted her to be like if our Lasser was in this Genshin Impact variant, but um, and so one of the things that's very notable about Arlisser is that she attacks really fast. Um, and her signature, her elemental skill, uh, calls back to her backstory about how she can cut open, uh, crabs with, um, with a knife, and she goes really fast. And then Dragonstorm is, of course, a reference to, um, original Arlisser, um, getting her burns in a Dragonstorm. Um, but of course, in this case, she is the Dragonstorm. Uh, visually, I, I think I'd want to work this a little bit more, but this is where I've got it for now. I've got a lot of these teardrop shapes for water, but also, that makes her look, it makes her look both sharp and, um, and rounded, with both the points of things as well as the curves of the teardrop shape. I think mm, I'm a big fan of using this motif as you can see all over her outfit here. And now I just do that process until the end. For the next five to 10 years, I'd make more of these characters and make all the character demos in the regions and release a new character like every 12 weeks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you understand how big that would be for me to do by myself? <laughs> that would be insane. Don't try this at home, kids. Don't make Skyrim by yourself. Before I leave you today, let's 
talk about what I imagined a typical play session in On My Impact, my On My Guru Impact might look like. Um, at this point, I'm off script, so if uh, if we're a little unhinged here, you're gonna just have to deal with it. So you would log in, you'd get your login bonuses, you'd get your little your cool little drops um, that would. Uh, I think I'd have them be uh, experience points basically to help you uh, level up. Maybe they would be items, maybe the items would be randomly generated so that you could um, have all these cool variants. Uh, you could check your mail to pick up your, uh, your free food or ingredients or food. I would definitely have food bonuses for things. Um, then for your daily tasks, the things that are designed to keep you coming back to the game day after day, I would have that be things like watering plants, or cooking, or eating yummy food, because we're really trying to create this cozy fantasy, right? So your daily tasks mm, are your farming things. Maybe it's like delivering mail and stuff to people. And then you talk to characters, and you can read their mail or whatever. Um, but, but once you watered all your plants, you ate your food, you collected some flowers, then it's time to go on the main story quest. Uh, I imagine so imagine like today you're in the life area and um, and you're uh, you you last only left off you would have been like um, you would have just discovered that uh, Frankenstein's monster while previously under control uh, has escaped out into the wilderness and you would go across all these glaciers and stuff you'd have to track him down by talking to people to see where he's gone when you lose the trail in the snow you'd have to physically look for his footprints in places and i think that'd be super cool there's a quest like that in genshin where they're like look for the footprints and i couldn't find them and so i had to google it and it was just the footprints on the actual ground that was so cool i but because Genshin isn't typically like that, I wasn't looking for them. Imagine if the whole game's like that, you're gonna notice these things. So you're like looking for footprints in the snow, broken twigs and stuff, and you track them down. When you lose the path, you're like talk to locals and see if they've seen anything. They put you back on the path. Mm. Um, and then maybe you get to like some old ruins, right? And um, and But the ruins have to be something. That's the thing about ruins. You can't just have generic ruins. These ruins could be like, um, if we're in the life domain, it could be an old workshop. Maybe we went back to um, the original secret workshop that uh, Victor Frankenstein built things in. So the place is locked down from the outside. Um, it's mostly designed to keep wolves and stuff out, um, maybe other monsters in the area. So you'd have to do some monster design. Um, maybe have these like light. You have all these like lightning things that um, they are like traps and they make the thing place difficult to navigate. But hypothetically, you're supposed to um, like uh, have turned them off from the inside. The thing is, is that Frankenstein's monster escaped with mm, by just like brute forcing through him because he's got a lot of health so you can't brute force your way back inside like you can see where he got out but you can't get back inside so eventually you have to like read once you get in like some layers you can read some of the uh books that literally show you how the electrical grid is laid out and then if you attack certain wires yeah you still take damage but the wires you attack will be permanently broken or at least temporarily broken maybe maybe they reset if you leave mm, they'll be broken long enough for you to navigate around and it'll turn off like you know the electricity different spots so you have to try to hit it as soon at the base and you sacrifice your health to do that and since you have limited health mm, you can't just like um uh you can't just brute force your way through it so finally you break your way in to uh to the boss chamber um, and, uh, oh, and maybe if it's too difficult, if your friend gets on, they can be like, oh, don't you know that, like, if you hit him with electricity, like, the first couple of times, it makes him stronger, but then when you hit him with, um, uh, with, or with the life thread stuff, um, for the third time, then he gets stunned, so you gotta hit him three times, and you have to, like, mm, so you have to, like, lure him around the battlefield and pull this lever mm, that channels, like, lightning from the big lightning frame and stuff, um, and uh and yeah and then your friend like helps distract them um and finally when the boss drops um you get the next um, the boss will get back up and then it'll be your friend because it's a cozy game so you can't actually kill people uh, and the boss is like oh i feel kind of bad for running away and then they help you with whatever the next story quest bit is um and then um 
Yeah, and then you and your friend uh, would have enough fate cords then to do a summon, and uh, you you uh, you would like click on it and do the little animation and be like. Psh. Oh, that's that would be rough. Oh my god. It could be a 50-50. Oh my god. Hello, my name is Emily. Is your inquiry perfume related by any chance? And then it'd be like, whoop wah, you got another character. And then uh, you'd have to build a new character. But of course you couldn't that day because you would be out of energy at that point after fighting a boss and doing all this stuff. And so then you and your friend would log out for the day but as you logged out, you would go to Amiguri's YouTube channel and hit like and subscribe. Make sure you come back for the next world building video or whatever other fantasy nonsense I'm doing next month. <laughs>